Good morning and Happy New Year to all Japan Society members and our partners at the Asia Society Tokyo as well. Very, you're very, all very welcome to this first Japan Society online webinar of uh, 2023 and the first of our regular Japan macro salons um, with Jesper Kohl. Well known to you all, Jesper Kohl uh, has been resident in Japan since uh, 1986, is one of the most noted economists and strategists uh, in the Japanese scene, has worked for a number of uh, international organizations, uh, including S.G. Warburg, including uh, J um, J.P. Morgan uh, and Merrill Lynch, now is a non-executive director at Monex Group uh, and the Japan Cap Catalyst Fund, and an advisor to anyone important you may care to name. We are today going to mark 2023 in, I think, a special way by having an extended discussion with uh, Jesper about prospects for the year. Many Japan Society members may have seen um, the uh, post of his from his Japan Optimist subsect site called 10 Surprises for 2023 for the Japanese economy. Um, and in the latter half of this discussion, I will focus on those potential surprises, things that could, uh, could un uh, derail or, or uh, positively um, upset our, our expectations for the year. But first, we're going to discuss um, the outlook, the, the base scenarios, both for the Japan and for the UK and Europe, and then move on to the vexed and very critical topic of monetary policy. So What's most important throughout this webinar is, of course, your questions, your input, and your thoughts. So please submit written questions whenever you you think of them in the Q, using the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screens, and I will draw upon them um, absolutely as soon as they fit uh, well in. Uh, so please so put in your views about what you're expecting and what you're worried about or what you're excited about in 2023, especially in Japan, but also in the environment for uh, business related to Japan worldwide. So let me begin, Jesper, perhaps by asking you about What's your base expectation as you move through January into 2023? Um, you are Japan's renowned last optimist, as you describe it, although I, I hear one or two other signs yeah. of optimism from other people in Japan. What's your basic feeling about the year? Look, um, I think, uh, you know, first of all, um, you know, a very happy new year to everybody. I look uh, forward to having uh, an active uh, uh, discussion today here. Um, you know, I think um, the good news, um, you know, in uh, Japan's economy is that uh, several of the drags um, that have been holding back uh, economic potential um, are actually being resolved. Um, and uh, the most important one uh, actually is business investment. Um, and uh, already since the late spring, early summer of last year, we've seen a steady acceleration in business investment expenditure. Um, and for all intents and purposes, um, you know, talking to CEOs, whether it's in the manufacturing sector, whether it's in the non-manufacturing sector, um, the animal spirits are back. Um, and so I do expect most importantly in uh, over the next 12 to 15 months that we will see more um, business investment expenditure. And it's actually a combination, which is very interesting, of both capital deepening um, as well as adding new capacity. And, um, you know, you've seen a little bit of onshoring. I don't want to make too much of this, um, you know, but you've seen some companies like Furukawa Electric, even Shiseido, um, you know, actually uh, committing to building uh, new production sites uh, here in Japan, which is really the, the first time since Prime Minister Koizumi, since the early 2000s, that we're actually seeing large listed manufacturing companies committing to Japan as a base. Uh, more interestingly um, is the fact that the service sector, um, you know, is actually upgrading their capital stock. Um, you know, and you can call it DX, uh, whether it's the digitalization, uh, whether it's also uh, investing, um, you know, in uh, generally better offices, 
um, you know, better equipment. Um, all of this seems to be coming through. So the bottom line is, I think that um, the corporate metabolism, um, you know, here um, is accelerating nicely. And I think that that momentum um, is going to be the absolute key, um, you know, um, in terms of a good visibility of growth, um, you know, going forward. The other point, Bill, um, I want to make very quickly, and we can talk about this, is that obviously a big drag was um, the net export performance because of the sharp deterioration in Japan's terms of trade, um, as well as some doldrums on the export side. And I think here the element to watch um, is um, twofold. Uh, number one, um, the America first policies, um, you know, with a lot of multinational companies now forced uh, because of Mr. Biden's industrial policy to set up new factories in the United States of America, that's going to benefit um, Japanese capital goods companies, Japanese robotics companies, Japanese machinery companies, because about 40% of the machinery that goes into a North American factory actually comes from Japan. So I think that, um, you know, this onshoring in the United States is going to give a nice boost to Japan's exports um, over the next uh, uh, six to 12 months, uh, if not even further than that. And then last but not least, and I'm not an expert here, but uh, we do obviously uh, see the People's Republic of China, um, you know, number one, easing both monetary and fiscal policy, and at the same time, opening up for COVID. And, you know, what that should mean is that exports from Japan to the People's Republic of China, you know, are also, um, you know, going to turn from headwinds um, into tailwinds. So watch out, particularly for business investment expenditure here at home, as well as, um, you know, exports to actually do very, very well and give a good shot in the arm to Japan's industrial sector. Well, that's very, very interesting. Thank you, Jesper. I mean, I think one aspect of that that, of course, one highlights is that particularly that inward investment story that you're saying about uh, big manufacturers investing in Japan is how Japan is so cheap. Uh, and we've talked about that before, how Japan has become cheap. Often people focus on the fact that Japanese workers are becoming cheap and therefore are people that, uh, as we've discussed, are being poached, but in relatively small numbers compared with the overall population, perhaps in skills, it, it, it matters. But if business investment is responding to that sense of Japan being cheap, that suggests that to me that, that those investors think that Japan is going to remain cheap um, as well over, the, over some sort of time uh, horizon for that uh, investment. Uh, which is also, from that point of view, pretty positive for the for, for the economy. Um, I would, moving now to the UK and Europe, I would, you know, suggest first of all that one syndrome that we've taken on in in the UK is, in a way, a, a Japan-like syndrome, and I don't mean by this Japanification in the sort of the the the, the sense that people talk about it to do with the actual economic. Um, uh, indicators, but rather a Japanification in the sense of an obsession with relative performance has taken right. hold in the UK. So there's a, a pessimism in the in the in the conversation about the UK because the UK is perceived as being likely to perform less well than its European neighbours and less well than the US, and that is well grounded that that the UK will perform less well. Um, and of course, as long as the strikes and industry and other disruption go on, then that that will make it worse, and we have, you know, likely to have more persistent inflation. But this shouldn't blind us, and shouldn't blind business. I think to the fact that actually, in terms of the outlook, it looks better today than it did a few months ago, uh, mm -hmm. both for the UK and for Europe. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, because actually the energy shock is easing. The energy shock, the deterioration in our terms of trade, but also in the pressure on cost of living through energy prices has reduced quite substantially since its peak last summer. Uh, gas prices in particular have, have fallen pretty uh, sharply. That is feeding through. Oil has at least more or less stabilized, um, and therefore um, the cost to motorists and and, uh, and hauliers and so forth has stabilized. So as insofar as we can predict, 
the sense is that um, many of those adverse indicators have peaked. Mm -hmm. um, uh, looking into 2023, one can't say we're going to go back to uh, either disinflation or to stable 2% inflation in, in, in Europe and the UK, right. but we can say that we're not going to stay at 10%. Um, right. We're going to perhaps go down to five on, the, on at least our foreseeable future, and that interest rate rises both by the Bank of England and by the uh, European Central Bank while they may well continue for a while so until the data becomes absolutely clear that this has peaked, nevertheless, the likely peak of those interest rates is lower than it looked like three to six months ago. So that the outlook for us is, as it were, perhaps, perhaps it is a recession. Certainly, like in Japan, real incomes are under pressure mm -hmm. um, and falling for many households. But from an investment point of view, from a business investment point of view, the good news is that it's not as bad as it looked. Um, and that this looks like perhaps a, an enduring but quite a shallow recession with um, a lot of investment opportunities around the edge, of course, particularly in energy. Um, and I would agree with you that both um, the strength, the continued resilience of the US and the reopening of China, whatever, you know, one, what, whatever happens in COVID terms, and, uh, and obviously that's a, you know, a, a human tragedy playing out in China, but in economic terms and supply terms, China is likely to be to at least some extent normalize with, as you say, efforts by the authorities to stimulate the economy and to uh, to uh, to support the economy and, and, and get it back to a, to a faster rate of growth. That's less important for the UK and Europe than it is to Japan, of course, but it is um, still has, has some salience for us. I mean, one issue that I'll bounce to you it, that, that matters to Europe, at least, and the UK, related to your onshoring or reshoring trend in the US, is what's the perception in Japan of whether US policy is, as it were, damagingly protectionist from a trading partner point of view? Or is that, or is this sort of just part of, as it were, a new normal? Um, of of reshoring that uh, we just have to get used to, and that perhaps we can find our ways to reconcile ourselves and and and, and equalize at, at opposite ends of the of the of the uh, seesaw. Because in Europe too, people accuse Europe of protectionism, particularly of a carbon a carbon tax uh, and border adjustment mechanisms and so forth. So, yeah. what's the mood in Japan as far as that those trading oh. issues are concerned? So, Bill, this is this is very, very interesting because, you know, this, in, in, in my opinion, is actually the fundamental change, um, you know, which is that America now does have a mercantilist, uh, a very America first uh, industrial policy. Um, it's actually remarkable how well coordinated the American government is, yes. um, you know, really, I mean, they're, they're almost like the way Japan was in the 1970s and 80s, uh, when METI actually ran the shop. Uh, you know, now, you know, the Department of Commerce in America does talk to the Treasury, does talk to the White House, and it's really, um, you know, one team, one dream, so to speak, um, that is coming through there. Now, uh, you know, the Japanese just accept that. And the mood here in Tokyo, um, you know, is from the business leader's perspective, right, uh, is one of rolling up their sleeves that, um, you know, the rejigging of supply chains, uh, the focus on in big picture words, you know, of self-reliance or reliance on friends only, um, you know, and as a result of that, a reconsidering of the global production map, um, you know, away from the Chinese sphere of influence, um, you know, is actually happening. You may have seen that Japan's foreign direct investment into the People's Republic of China uh, last year for the first time in, as far as I can remember, uh, actually turned negative. Uh, now, there's obviously the covid you know, you want to be careful with, with, with last year's data in the People's Republic of China because of all these lockdowns, um, you know, but still the overarching mood, which is what you ask, right, uh, is one, look, America says uh, jump and the Japanese ask how high. Um, yeah. Case in point, uh, when uh, President Biden did pass the Inflation Reduction Act, which really is this industrial policy in America, um, within 36 hours, 
Um, you had Toyota, you had Kians, you had, um, you know, Pioneer, um, you know, and Panasonic, and now, not Pioneer, Panasonic, you know, announced about almost uh, $18 billion worth of new factory commitments to be built in the United States of America. And you remember, Bill, that uh, Japan has always been very well on that. I mean, the whole, um, you know, episodes of what we had in the 1980s, um, you know, when uh, America began playing hardball uh, on car exports from Japan, um, you know, which really triggered because of the volume constraints, um, you know, triggered, uh, you know, the first wave of big, um, you know, outward investment from Japan into the United States of America. And the Japanese built some of the most productive car factories, right, um, in the United States, you know, uh, coming from that. So, you know, the, 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 the discontent is not in the business community to American leadership. Um, the discontent is more broadly from the fact that uh, Prime Minister Kishida did force this doubling of defense spending um, outside the session of parliament, um, outside, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of disgruntlements about this. Um, and as you know, um, you know, fine, we now have got this headline number of going to 2% of GDP on defense spending. Uh, but how exactly this is going to be funded um, yeah. is a big mystery. And uh, Prime Minister Kishida, I mean, you know, does not make a very strong figure at the point because he recently said at the end of December, he said something hilarious because he said like, oh, well, well, I, I certainly promise not to raise taxes before the next election. Well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, so so but but the the, the serious point, um, you know, is, um, you know, is the fact that uh, tax increases are now on the agenda. And, and remember, it was actually Prime Minister Abe, um, you know, when he had his second uh, lower house election, he actually enshrined in the LDP platform to not raise uh, taxes further. Right uh, to keep mm. the consumption tax in particular at ten percent, and for all intents and purposes, now you know the specter of tax increases is on the agenda. Um, you know there'll be a political expediency in terms of when to do it, but it was quite interesting. The MOF, the Ministry of Finance, of course, is is very clever and very good. Uh, you may have seen that uh, as part of the national budget, uh, there are now some subsidies uh, for uh, having children that are being increased in order to, um, you know, help support the birth rate, hopefully, um, you know, but the Ministry of Finance immediately said, well, that's why we're going to have to raise the, uh, the, the consumption tax, right? <laughs> yes, so, yes. I mean, you know, increasing child support as well as defense spending, as well as, um, you know, putting in, uh, you know, big, uh, um, you know, anti-inflation support measures, um, you know, as well as, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, the, 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 as well as um, doing the GX, the, the green investment program. Um, I mean, these things add up and it's not your fault, it's not my fault. I mean, the borrowing requirement from the treasury here is still in excess of 10 percent of gdp yes yeah you no know, absolutely so, it's quite eye-watering yeah absolutely no you know, it, it, one should not lose sight of that yeah yeah and so you know again if you ask me i mean i'm i'm, I'm very you know enthusiastic uh, from my conversations with ceos in particular that the animal spirits that the business investment that the private sector you know, metabolism and quest for growth and investment for growth, that that is back in Japan. But at the same time, you know, there is this uh, creep in of, uh, you know, fiscal rectitude. Um, you know, as, as a German, I'm allowed to say this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, of, uh, th that is starting to be uh, 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 to, to, to surface. Interesting. No, absolutely. Um, uh, yes. So in, in Britain, of course, we had a brief um, experience of fiscal recklessness last September when um, 
when go for it was essentially the slogan of the 45 day prime minister, um, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. But now Jeremy Hunt, perhaps it is his Japanese background at the, uh, <laughs> that, is, that is making him um, absolutely the, the man of fiscal rectitude as our new chancellor of the exchequer. Now, I'm going to bring in a question um, because it follows on from some of the topics that uh, we've been discussing. Richard uh, Shiva has, says, uh, we're all encouraged by more investment that will benefit the Japanese economy. But do you, Jesper, think that there is enough of that investment aimed at de-risking supply chains, given the more intense security environment driven by Russia, Ukraine, China, Hong Kong, Strait, Taiwan, and maybe even post-COVID reactions and other global hotspots, which is by the way, to say, is is the right attitude to this? You ain't seen nothing yet. In other words, is business fully reacting to the changed geopolitical scene? So, so, so what is interesting on that is, um, you know, it, it's wonderful being in Japan for so many decades. Um, because, I mean, Japan always has every two or three or four years, unfortunately, there's some sort of disaster that disrupts supply chains, right? Yeah. Whether it's a typhoon, whether it's a flood, whether it's an earthquake, um, you know, and then remember, uh, there were the big Thai floods that supposedly took out, you know, Japan's car and car components industry. Um, the reality is that at least so far, all these supply shocks were solved very, very quickly. I mean, the global economy in general and the ability to source alternative suppliers actually is quite remarkable. And it's, 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 it's very interesting. I mean, you know, when last year, remember this time, you know, we had these huge spikes in the price of lumber. Right. And that was sort of the first inflation shock. And oh, my God, you know, everything is going to go to hell, particularly in America, because American houses are built with wood and the lumber price has gone up tenfold or, or whatever it was. Well, you know, it literally took four months, you know, for this to come down. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, and it's quite interesting because a lot of the economies actually have seen steady growth in industrial production, um, you know, despite the semiconductor shortage supposedly choking everybody off. Right. Um, and if you look at semiconductor prices, it's not exactly a picture of, um, you know, a compounding a supply side bottleneck. Now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Fine. You can always make that argument. Right. And if we take out uh, Taiwan from the global supply chain, we obviously wow. haven't seen anything yet. Um, but I think, you know, um, certainly I think it, it, it's right to be optimistic um, about how quickly the global supply chain, um, you know, actually responds, um, you know, to some of these challenges coming through. But importantly, and this I just want to reiterate the point, you know, Japanese business leaders are fully aware and are not just aware, but they're actually rolling up their sleeves and putting business plans together to restructure their global supply chain. Now, any supply chain, any business investment expenditure, obviously, it depends on the industry, um, you know, but th these are not fly by night software companies, right? Um, yeah. Or web designers, right? I mean, to for Toyota to change, um, you know, its, uh, 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 you know, supply chain, you know, you're talking a five to six, at least year uh, long process, right? But that process has begun. And in my personal opinion, you know, un unless the Americans and the Chinese, uh, you know, kiss and make up, um, you know, uh, you know, that process is, is not going to end. So Japan is the bottom line is, you know, the, the, that uh, Japan is doing what it's supposed to do, um, you know, is no longer complacent, is not accepting business as usual and will be a big marginal beneficiary of the rest of the world, um, you know, also waking up to the new realities and building new factories, new production hubs, et cetera. One final question from this batch before we move perhaps into monetary policy for a while um, is from Paul Diamond about the defense dividend, as it were, um, mm. from, for the aerospace sector arising from the new defense policy that you described. I mean, I would preface that by saying, I think it's mislead. Every, it's always misleading to think of this as a doubling of, Jap of Japan's defense spending because a lot of it is going to be redefinition or some of it is going to be redefinition, if I understand it, of the Coast Guard and um, things like that and uh, that, that have been 
in excess of 1% and not badged in the past as defense. So there'll be some, to some degree, there will be a, it won't, it won't be as much as it looks, but it's still going to be pretty substantial. Uh, and presumably it is going to be pretty good for the defense sector. And we've got a joint fighter project involving uh, Mitsubishi heavy industries um, uh, and, and others, uh, including uh, UK companies. How excited are people about that? And are you about that? Is that an investment theme or is it the, the, the answer is, um, you know, it is not. Um, it is an investment theme in uh, some of the um, venture capital, uh, you know, uh, firms that I advise um, and that I'm on the investment committee on in the sense of that startups will benefit from this. But quite frankly, you know, the conglomerates that do do the bulk of Japan's defense spending, right, the marginal contribution that you get, right, uh, from Mitsubishi Heavy, um, you know, uh, engaging, you know, in a in a in a medium term uh, new fighter jet program, the marginal profit contribution. I mean, you literally need a magnifying glass, right, um, in order to uh, uh, to make that worthwhile. However, when you look at, for example, drone systems, right, um, Japan actually is quite good. I mean, obviously, China is very dominant, right, uh, in terms of the global market share. But in terms of specialized drones, um, you know, and some of the drone components, um, you know, uh, Japan is actually doing a very, very good job. And there's some very exciting and interesting little startups, right, uh, that are coming to the fore. Um, and that are uh, making, uh, uh, you know, making hay, as it were, or that will have a very concentrated business where, from an investment perspective, you can actually reap the benefits rather than the benefits going to support, you know, the toaster division at Mitsubishi Electric. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm being a bit facetious here, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, but the, 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 the point about the increase in defense spending um, is actually very important. And when, when you know, the, one of the, the, the last conversations I had with Prime Minister Abe or, or former Prime Minister Abe, um, you know, last year, it's like, okay, fine, this defense spending here, what, what should it actually be on, right? And it really was the basics. It was the fact that the barracks of the self-defense forces here do not have air conditioning. The fact that a recruit to the self-defense forces very famously has to bring uh, his or her own toilet paper uh, because it's not being supplied. Um, you know, so when you actually look at at least the, the defense budget details for the next 12 months, for the new year, for the new fiscal year, um, actually about two thirds of that is actually just basic provisions here more ammunitions, better equipment in the barracks, et cetera. So the basic stuff, rather than the high-flying, high-profile stuff. So if you wanted to be clever from an investment perspective, you know, um, if you find out, I mean, probably Daikin, uh, you know, an air conditioning company, um, you know, is, is, you know, is, is actually going to be quite a big uh, beneficiary of this at the margin. Right. Yes, exactly. No, and they, they famously, as you say, the conditions for a recruit and for a family, if they're if they're away from base, are much worse for, a, for the Japanese self defense forces than they are for for, for the U.S. ones and comp comparable ones. Um, let's just we'll go back to startups in a second. There's a few questions about startups, but let's talk a bit about monetary policy. Um, Richard Dunn has asked. Um, Please, can you can you take us through your thoughts on the recent U-turn by uh, Mr. Kuroda, um, who, as we know, is about to leave by the end of by the end of March? Um, well, my question on that is: Yes, take us to go home. But what does it amount to? I mean, um, the the sense of change that uh, that was triggered off in December by um, this technical, pretty technical change of policy. That I can't say that I wanted to spend a lot of time trying to understand the technicalities of it. But clearly, the question is: Is this a harbinger of a big change, or is it a minor adjustment? No, look, I mean, um, you know, I think that it is not a minor adjustment. Um, you know, it is um, basically allowing the monetary machine, the functioning of money markets, right, uh, to actually get get going again, right, and to actually see how this works. Because, I mean, we forget, 
you know, it's it's been more than a decade. It's been, it's been basically, you know, um, you know, almost a generation since we've had de facto zero policy rates, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we've had negative interest rates, still have negative interest rates at the short end, um, you know, and, uh, you know, then you've had the yield curve control being bringing about this enormous financial depression uh, for Japan's financial institutions because you can't make money. Um, because there's no yield curve um, that you can actually arbitrage with. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, Governor Kuroda, um, you know, actually uh, has given a gift to his successor in the sense that we are now seeing how does the money market reliquify and um, how does the bond market reliquify at these elements? And it was very interesting, right? Because you know, literally, he wants to have his cake and eat it um, because you are very importantly, you are obviously raising the yield cap from 25 basis points to 50 basis points. Right. But at the same time, you increase your war chest of the budget for bond purchases by the Bank of Japan from seven to nine trillion yen. Which, by the way, if you calculate this out, that alone would cover about 80% of the issuance of bonds um, that is coming from Kishida's extra budget and from the new issuance from the new budget. So you're, you're literally having your cake and eating it, um, you know, if, if, if I may use this new uh, British expression, um, you know, in the sense of that, you know, the war chest is there. Let's see how the market responds. And Bill, what's very interesting is that you, you, you can be very concerned, obviously, about the, the level of government debt here. But you and I and, you know, many of our investment friends have been concerned about this for the last 25 years, yeah. right? Um, what is interesting is that uh, literally within 12 hours of Kuroda making the decision, Nippon Life, the largest life insurance companies, um, you know, increased their allocation to JGB because their guaranteed rate on savings products is 0.45%. So at 0.5%, I can buy the bond, clip the coupon and play golf all day. <laughs> Yes. No, but but you, you understand the point. I I mean, people forget, you know, that there is an enormous savings pool in Japan. Um, and as long as the Bank of Japan, and this will be the big challenge, as long as the Bank of Japan can keep expectations that whatever it is they will do is a gradual movement, right? Yes. It is a step-by-step -step steepening of the yield curve rather than a radical abandoning. I mean, if you take away the yield cap, right, all sorts of things will happen. I mean, the market would become probably very chaotic, right? Yes. Um, you know, by some estimates, you should have, you know, given the way nominal GDP is now growing, you know, you should have 10-year yields of somewhere between, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, of somewhere between 2 and 3%. Right. I mean, is, is 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 anybody in Japan going to allow for that to happen? The answer is no. Right. Right. And um, so I think you know, just to recap, um, you know, I think that it was actually a very pragmatic decision. Um, I like everybody else. I, I, I expected it to come in the spring. I didn't expect it to to come. But, you know, it, it, that's what central banks did, which is what my friend who is in the running um, to to be. Um, you know, uh, to be to be the governor, um, he says it's like, well, we certainly show everybody who is boss. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah is, which is which is which is important, right? I mean, people forget. Oh, you shocked the market, isn't it? No, it's like the intervention when the Ministry of Finance started to intervene in the currency market at around one forty-five, right? Everybody says, oh, that's a waste of money. The yen is going to two hundred, right? But yeah. Again, if you look back, pragmatically speaking, wow, they certainly got the timing right. Yeah, no, it is. That's absolutely right. The art of the central banker is to show is to remain the boss uh, and to control the agenda and control the narrative. And so I think I would agree with you as a more distant observer that the initial worry in December was, oh, my God, have they thought this through? Um, if this is the first of many disruptions, then perhaps you know all hell could break loose. But it does not any longer feel that way. It feels as if this was a, were a deliberate and thought through changing of some of the parameters. 
uh, in which case uh, it's an, un an undoubtedly sustainable and, and, and strong thing. Um, now, it got a little extra shock, that, shock because of the, the like non-Japanese thought, which is, oh my God, they'll be appointing a newcomer and that newcomer might well change everything you know, afterwards and there's another lot of instability. But I think that's, of course, in the Japanese context, as we all know, a complete misunderstanding of the way this will work. What are your expectations about the new appointment? Will it come very soon? Um, um, we're running out of time. I mean, as, as you know, I think as we speak, uh, Prime Minister Kishida is uh, arriving in London. Yes. Um, so um, I hope you'll show him a good time. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, in all seriousness, I mean, Kishida will make the decision. Um, what do we know about Kishida is that he is somebody who doesn't take any risks. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, the probability of, um, you know, uh, a, a surprise appointment, um, you know, I think is very small. Um, I, I think the debate about names is, is, in my personal opinion, relatively irrelevant, because the only interesting thing is that everybody who's on the agenda is a Bank of Japan person. Yes, um, which is the, rota the rotation, right? Yeah. Exactly. So it's back to the standard rotation, um, you know, coming through. Um, I think it is very clear what the new governor is going to do. Uh, I think the path will be very clear, which is the first thing he uh, will do um, is, um, you know, uh, announce a study, a comprehensive study of Bank of Japan's monetary policy. And that will take anywhere between six months and 15 months, right? And during those, um, you know, six months starting in April, the most important things that we need to know about the global economy or the global monetary economy are going to become clear. Namely, is America having a soft landing or a hard landing? And yes. that at the end of the day, right, I think is um, the uh, uh, the primary concern, right, um, you know, that you actually have here. The risk of a runaway dollar appreciation and yen depreciation, that risk seems to have been mitigated, um, you know, by, you know, the way the Federal Reserve, you know, uh, uh, is starting to signal things. Um, you know, at the same time, here in the local money markets, right, um, you know, people are very, very happy. I mean, you've seen Japanese bank shares finally, you know, after a hiatus of almost a decade, you know, have performed very well. Mitsubishi Bank is very happy. Mizuho Bank is very happy. Um, and the interesting thing is, in terms of the impact of higher interest rates on the real economy, right, um, there's one thing that one needs to be concerned. There's, there's two things that you need to be concerned about, right? And the first one is that the mortgage market in Japan has fundamentally changed. Uh, it used to be 10 years ago, it used to be that about 80% of the mortgages were fixed rate mortgages, right? And only 20% were floating rates. Now it's exactly the other way around. So oh. actually an increase in short-term rates, right? Um, you know, because these things tend to be priced off somewhere around the five-year point, right? Um, these variable rate mortgages, right? How much of a break on the housing sector are we actually going to be seeing? Now, right now, the changes are minuscule. I mean, mortgage rates for a 10-year, uh, you know, private mortgage rate, you know, basically have just gone up, uh, you know, by about 25 basis points, which... For all intents and purposes, given that winter bonuses were actually up by almost 10 percent, right, um, uh, you know, is, 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 is really not a big thing. Right. But this, you know, interest rate elasticity of the Japanese economy, right, because of this change in the way the mortgage sector has evolved towards floating rate rather than fixed rates, right? That is something that, you know, you want to monitor, right? Particularly into the back end of uh, 2023 and 2024. Right, no, that's a very good signal for us all. Um, let me ask one more question. There's lots of great questions coming in um, from, from our audience. So there's one more question about the BOJ before we move on to uh, other things and startups especially. But Thomas uh, Jelf, has asked with a converse question, under what macro conditions would the, would the BOJ raise the policy rate this year or next? E.g., what sort of inflation and wage 
rate would be required. So what would it take in terms of, as it were, this comes to your surprises type theme, what would it take really to change that perspective for uh, the BOJ that you've been outlining? Um, I, very, very good question, uh, Thomas. And that's, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I wish I had the perfect answer to that, right? Um, you know, one of the candidates, um, you know, who is currently in the Bank of Japan, um, you know, for Bank of Japan governor is very clear. He's a, he's a big fan of the whole output gap analysis, um, you know, and basically, you know, if you were to see, right, um, you know, by the summer of this year, um, the output gap actually being, um, you know, no longer negative, but actually being positive, right? Um, you know, I do think that you would start to see, uh, you know, some changes there. Uh, wages, um, you know, and incomes in particular, right? It's very, very interesting because, and, and sorry, this gets very complicated. I, I, I wish I could show you the chart. Um, um, wage growth is, is uh, basically stagnant, um, but income growth is rising, and that is because of the fiscal support measures that Mr. Kishida just authorized. So the grants and um, you know contributions, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, from the public sector to the household sector, um, you know, are actually going up over the next uh, two quarters, um, you know, by almost one percent of GDP. Um, so you 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 actually have a distortion in the sense of that income growth is going to be faster for temporarily because of the fiscal accelerator that you get, which of course then in the second half, presuming that there's not going to be a major supplementary budget anymore, right, um, is going to be a drag. So you know even if wage growth were to be running at three or four percent. Right. And um, the fact that uh, the drag on the household sector from the uh, end of the COVID support. Right. Um, you know, that alone, you know, would 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 put a dampener on demand as well. Right. If I if I make myself a little bit clear. So I think yes. ironically, I think that, um, you know, the, the Bank of Japan actually has a very, very good runway, um, you know, in the sense of actually having some time where demand is going to be very strong, where they can actually allow for the yield curve to steepen further. Right. I certainly would, would think that, um, you know, when we meet in uh, six months' time um, at this uh, at this session, um, you know, I do think that the yield cap for the ten-year bond, uh, you know, is going to be uh, somewhere around one and a quarter, if not one point five percent, right? Because right. the one thing, the one thing, Bill, that has changed, and and I've been wrong, um, you know, uh, is is the fact that you know the inflationary pressures, right, are actually spreading. Um, which is very interesting, right? And I can just give you the examples and you may have seen, I mean, you may remember from, from previous analysis that, you know, the bulk of the output gap is domestic travel uh, that was repressed by the fear of COVID. And domestic travel has been going gangbusters. And on top of that, we obviously have, you know, inbound tourism there. And you find that uh, it's not just the Grand Hyatt um, that has trebled, trebled its prices um, over the last six months. Oh, really? But now you find that even the upper hotel, um, so the basic business hotel uh, here, they've just increased prices by about 20%. So it's it's quite interesting, you know, that that the price pressure, not on goods, but in the service sector, which is much closer to demand pull, um, you know, rather than cost push, you know, the, the demand pull element of inflation, you know, does appear to have accelerated. Right. OK, that is an important uh, indicator as well. And I mean, Martin Barrow was asked about the tourism sector. Will it recover in both directions? Obviously, this is one of Martin's themes. Um, will the, I mean, what more can the government do to encourage this, he asks, but will this be of, of a priority to the government or will this be something actually that they will put on the back burner precisely for the reason that you say, that actually the market is already hot um, and uh, encouraging it further would simply put, put uh, more oil on the fire? 
Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, and, and Martin, uh, you know, knows this, of course, extremely well. Um, Prime Minister Abe and particularly Mr. Suga, when he was the Kambochokan, when he was the, what is that called, the government spokesman, uh, very, very focused, um, you know, and, and really utilizing inbound tourism, um, you know, as a very, very aggressive growth, uh, growth policy. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes, my interpretation and my contacts um, and my discussions with the with the government here, it's 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 very much on the back burner. It's right. very much on the. And what about know? outward tourism? Is that being pushed at all, or is it just that's an organic factor? Presumably, no. we've got the tourists I'm, I'm, coming to London, but I'm 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 not aware. I'm not aware. Nobody's invited me. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, let's let's move to startups because there are several good questions no. about startups, which of course are also part of the. Kishida government's kind of uh, new new capitalism um, mantra, uh, but also been something that you've been very active active in, um, in in advising a lot of startups. Several people have asked about that. Masako uh, Eguchi Bacon um, asked about asks how do you see this focus on startups? Will it really become integrated into Japanese thinking, Japanese business and society, or will it end up as a boom and bust like ones we've had in the past? Stephen Gomosol asks, what's, what progress is there um, on, on this area? Uh, and similarly, another question from Richard uh, Shiva. So therefore, we've got quite a theme here of, of, of interest in, in, this, in this side of the, Jap of the Japanese scene, which perhaps is something that's coming through to become more apparent to the outside world. So, so, um, so, so the upshot is um, it is now part and parcel of government policy. While in the past it really wasn't, um, you know, entrepreneurship, startups, um, it's almost that, you know, startups were a little bit frowned upon because they become challengers, um, you know, to the establishment. That's no longer the case. Um, so you find that even the big boys, uh, the Kedanren, right, uh, which is the bastion, you know, of uh, of the insiders, um, you know, even they, um, you know, are embracing this. Um, and the fact that uh, Nambasan, um, you know, is now the vice chair of the Kedanren, um, you know, she, um, you know, who uh, obviously founded a company that's been successful, Dana, um, you know, she's quite involved, um, you know, in actually the generational change um, in the establishment of Japan. And with that generational change, you know, comes a very positive attitude, um, you know, towards embracing startups. Um, so it's there. Um, there's a lot of government money um, being mobilized around this. And it's obviously not directly from, um, you know, to some extent it is directly with, with METI, you know, running a couple of, uh, uh, of funds, obviously, uh, you know, but there's a lot of indirect money coming uh, that you've got, you know, for example, the uh, DBJ, the Japan Development Bank, right? Uh, really becoming a big, um, you know, focal point, um, you know, for uh, coordinating and directing uh, um, you know, a lot of the startup activity there. So it's it's almost, I mean, I was with, um, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with the prime minister's office, uh, you know, um, in, 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 in the autumn of last year, when this got going and said, well, what can we do? And my initial response was get out of the way, um, <laughs> you know, because, because, and this is where it gets interesting. And so I don't think that the problem with the Japanese startup problem is that there is, um, you know, too little too late. Um, it's a little bit that there is too much and too little emphasis on failure, because the whole point of venture capital is that 10 guys that you invest in, nine of which go bust. And the faster they go bust, the better it is for the one survivor. I mean, I'm being a little bit facetious, yeah. but that's how, that's, that's how these portfolios run. And, um, you know, as you know, um, Japan's problem, at least in my opinion, you know, is the fact that there's no exit, right? That there's very few bankruptcies that you've got. I mean, the statistics are almost scary. Um, you know, the, the, you know, according to Shoko data, um, you know, you now have 12% of Japan's companies um, have not been able to cover their interest expense out of profits for the last five years. So it's not a COVID thing, 
right? Mm. So what, what is called zombie companies, I mean, and we can, we can argue about a definition, but the fact that even with interest rates being de facto close to nil, the cost of debt capital being so low, you can't cover your interest expense for five consecutive years, I'm not sure you deserve to exist. No. You know, and so, so, so again, just to, so, so I think that the accelerator, um, you know, in terms of encouraging failure, uh, not, en sorry, encouraging startups, encouraging entrepreneurships, everything is pointing in the right direction. Um, but I am a little worried, right, that, you know, the actual harsh realities of, yes, 90% of these companies will have to fail, right, or will fail that reality is not being sponsored and is not being driven home on. Now, is it real? Let me give you one data. It's my, my new favorite data set, um, which is the following. If you look at the Ministry of Finance, METI, and the COSATIO, so the Ministry of Health, yeah? Those are the three elite ministries in Japan. Uh, no offense if there's somebody here from, from another ministry uh, on the call here, but the big three elite ministries in Japan, as you know, recruit every year uh, between 20 and 25 people for the elite, for the career, for the top career track, right? Um, over the last decades, right? the attrition rate, right? People resigning to do something else, um, you know, by between when they get recruited in their early 20s, um, you know, to uh, the mid 30s to 35, the attrition rate has been less than 1%. Right. Over the last three years, it's in excess of 9%. The chart looks like this. It looks like a hockey stick. And when you talk to the people at the personnel division, you actually find, well, where do these people go, right? And they're not going to Goldman's. They're not going to JP Morgan. They're not going to uh, Mitsubishi. The bulk of them, 80% or so, actually go to startups. So if the elite bureaucrats, right, the guys from Todai who are at the Ministry of Finance, if they actually go to startups, something's changing. Yes. Something's changing. No, that is, that is, <laughs> that is right. Um, and... Uh... Among the young, I mean, young people, so you know, who are graduates, the great graduates from Todai or other top universities. I mean, in the past, they might have thought one those ministries, two uh, the big, the big corporations, and so forth. If they are now, as many people say to me, they are three now thinking about startups. Are they? I mean, a key question: Are they prepared to work not just for one startup, but for four startups? <laughs> Three of which fail, and then they and then they move on to the next one. Uh, I mean, that's in a way the cultural change that has to happen for them, whether they leave the ministry or whether they come from straight as graduates. They've got to be a bit more American in the sense of believing that failure is part of the development process. Um, and I wonder how that'll happen. No, and and this 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 will be you know I mean the the the, the really interesting development over the next couple of years. I think over the next two or three years we know right. Yeah. Um, I mean. I can tell you, we just had an investment committee meeting at one of the big funds, uh, uh, venture capital funds that I'm advising it. And, uh, you know, the down rounds, right, uh, right now um, are very significant. And it really is the first time, um, you know, since this whole venture capital thing started to get going uh, about four or five years ago, that you actually are seeing down rounds. And the, the down rounds are, I mean, there, there, there hasn't been a single one, at least of the portfolios companies, uh, you know, we, we've been involved with, um, you know, there hasn't been a single one that isn't at least 50%. Mm. Right. Um, so, so it's quite interesting, right? Um, you know, which which is another litmus test. If you if if we want to talk VC in particular, I mean, the question is, I mean, typically during the down rounds, um, you know, what happens in the rest of the world is that you've got debt finance, um, you know, starting to come in, um, and it is very very difficult. Um, I mean, there's, 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 there's a couple, Auzora Bank, uh, you know, and a couple of other banks do have some notional funds, right, for debt VC funding, you know, but again, having access to debt, you know, um, particularly when times are hard, um, you know, um, that's going to be a big question, um, you know, uh, whether that function, uh, you know, the debt 
uh, uh, financing for venture capital, whether that can actually sustain, you know, some of the companies, um, you know, over the next, uh, you know, 12 months or so. Now, we've, we're coming towards the close of our time. So I'm, and we've actually had some great questions still coming in. I'll come back if I get time. But uh, there's, we've been so optimistic and so, and so positive, I feel, that I just want to bring in one of your 10 surprises. Uh, that you wrote in your Japan Optimist piece, because it, it was one that I think the implications of it are pretty important. I think the implication generally of our conversation has been that, well, yes, your first surprise that Japan turns out to grow faster than either the UK, the UK or, uh, UK or China, the US or China seems to be quite plausible to me um, for 2023, for example. Um, Kishida calling a snap general election. Well, again, that could happen with the approval rate, rates and so forth, the raising of taxes. We talked about that. But let me ask about China and currency. Um, you raised as well, the one thing, one thing that keeps you awake at night, in effect, would be the thought of what of the China under economic pressure, in which, which really means under domestic political pressure, um, would start an Asian currency war by an aggressive devaluation of the of the renminbi. Um, how would that play out from a Japanese point of view? How would that, how would the splashes from that uh, that currency tsunami sort of arrive in in Japan? And what is it about that or what, that worries you? Look, I mean, it, it, it's very straightforward, right? Um, in the sense that um, you know, if I mean, in, in in my head, right, the dynamics of the global economy, you know, it's it's actually interesting. You and I always want to focus on Japan, but I mean. Look, you know, the big boys are China and the United States, and they've been desynchronized, right? Um, in the sense that America was red hot while China was slowing. And the question last year was how will America respond to the brake pedal from the Federal Reserve? And yeah. the answer is it responds exactly the way it has always done, right? With the interest rate sensitive sectors, you know, actually leading a very nice slowdown. Thank you, right? The question for 2023 in the global economy, the most important question is whether the accelerator in the People's Republic of China can still work, right? And that's where Richard Ku becomes very interesting again, because is China in a liquidity trap? Uh -huh. You know, is, is, you know, there too much debt that, yes, you're easing monetary policy. Yes, you're doing a little bit on fiscal policy. But is it actually going to be too little too late, um, you know, to actually allow, um, you know, for the Chinese economy to actually respond? That's where it gets very, very interesting to me. So the question is, China stepping has been stepping on the accelerator, you know, since the summer of last year. How much is this working? Is the fact that Mr. G made a big about turn on COVID policy, which really, quite frankly, from a Japanese perspective, would be hilariously embarrassing, right? I mean, you, you, my God, J Japan would never do an about turn like that in no. public policy, right? But China apparently did. Is it because they're so desperate because the accelerator on money and fiscal policy on the traditional macro levers, right, um, you know, are not really working to reduce the unemployment rate of the young in the People's Republic of China, right? And so if in, if in the summer of this year, we still have a Chinese economy that isn't staging a V-shaped recovery or the look of a V-shaped recovery, I think the potential or the risk of, you know, China devaluing its currency in order to buy global market share, to buy global competitiveness is very real. And this is where it gets interesting because it's not your fault, it's not my fault. Japan and China are competitors. They're no longer complementary. China makes perfectly functioning, perfectly fine Shinkansen bullet trains. You know, yes. and if you can offer it at a 30% discount to the Indonesians, yeah, they buy it. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and that see, wouldn't ripple so much directly through financial markets, presumably, because of the lack of the convertibility, but it would ripple through trade and therefore through the, through the securities markets, um, if that were to, were to happen. 
That's really and, what I mean, look, and, and, and quite frankly, I mean, unless, you know, you know, the, 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 there's obviously the counter argument that, oh, the politics will take care of that. And so a Japanese machine tool company will never have to fear competition from a Chinese machine tool maker ever again because they're in the wrong camp. Um, yes. I mean, is, is that really how business works? I mean, I, I, you know, we're not, I mean, hopefully we'll never get to this sort of war economy, right? No, indeed. Well, let's finish with a, there's a, a, a delightful question from Isabella Donjoa um, here. If I, correct me, apologies if I pronounced your name wrong, Isabella, um, which I think is a fitting way to uh, um, say goodbye to Jasper for this. Uh, she says, this and past seminars have had a positive outlook for Japan. But you, Bill, mentioned Mr. Cole might be Japan's last optimist. Well, that, that's that's Jesper's uh, term for himself. But but uh, the Japan optimist is the name of his of his Substack, at least. Could you, however, explain why others would not be equally optimistic? How are others reading the situation differently? By which to say is are, are you is the new consensus around Jesper Cole, or are you do you feel an outlier? No, no, no. Look, and and this is this I I this is a long discussion. And Isabella uh, or anybody on this call, if you ever find yourself in Tokyo, um, you know, please, uh, you know, let's have a glass of wine or whatever it is that 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 you favor, because that's obviously the real question. And I will tell you that uh, the problem is not the global community. The, 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 the global community. I mean, there's some who hate Japan, some who love Japan, some who are cyclically bullish, some who are. This the whole argument is there, but um, I spend you know at least every other weekend um, you know talking to Japanese investors, right? And a lot of it is retail investors, right? And wow, I mean, if you think you're pessimistic, you should meet the locals. Um, you know, so, I mean, so, sorry, you know, I, I don't mean to be facetious, right? But I mean, this, 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 this fact that one in four Japanese in about 24 months is going to be over the age of 70. Um, you know, the fact that, oh, you know, Japan is no longer the second largest, it's only the fourth, the third largest, and it's about to become the fourth largest economy, yada, da. I mean, you know, just open a Japanese newspaper, right? And I'm not talking about the Nikkei, um, you know, just open any Japanese newspaper. And uh, unfortunately, you know, um, God, you know, there's a lot of negativity there. So I think that, um, you know, for the global community, I, I always joke, you know, um, sometimes I'm uh, the last optimist, but every two years I'm the first optimist because others will join because Japan has a cyclical boom in financial markets, right? So that's fine. But in the local community, right, the Japanophobia, right, um, like really the angst that Japan is sinking into the Pacific Ocean, that Japan is doomed because of the demographic overhang, um, you know, that's the real uphill battle that you've got to fight. Um, and, uh, you know, that's where I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see whether the young entrepreneurs and the success stories of young entrepreneurs actually do get embraced um, you know, rather than, oh, my God, Toshiba is the symbol of, you know, what Japan is, i.e. once a crown jewel of global competitiveness. And now, oh, my God, what's going on? Picked over by vultures. Right. Um, you know, while, you know, will we get some real success stories, um, you know, where proud new enterprises, you know, actually spring out um, and lead Japan towards, you know, more confidence that they can actually do well and look i'm german they did beat germany quite smartly and gloriously uh, in the recent world cup what a delightful note on which to end uh, end this uh, fascinating discussion a very fitting discussion to uh, celebrate the start of the new year thank you very much to you jesper for, for joining me to, of course, all of our audience, both from the Asia Society uh, in Tokyo uh, and from uh, our great friends among Japan Society members and followers around the world. Um, we look forward to seeing you in three months' time. Um, and this is going to be a very, very interesting year, I think, both in the economy and in markets and, of course, in politics. So join us again. But renewed thanks to you, Jesper. Great to see you. Uh, and good to see you all here. Thank you for your support for the Japan Society. Have a Thank great Thank you time. and Happy New Year. Happy.